Ladies and gentlemen, the doubts are beginning to creep in surrounding the Philadelphia 76ers. Following the Paul George edition, which has been the headline of this NBA offseason, there was a great deal of praise heading the Sixers and Daryl Morey's direction. But after a little bit, it does feel like the pendulum is swinging and the doubts are beginning to creep in. And that being headlined by Brian... Brian Windhurst himself. He went on ESPN's first take to say that he is tired of the idea that adding Paul George changes everything for the team and goes on to say, quote, this is now the fourth time that you could say he was a leading headline in the offseason and the previous three have led to what? So I do want to dive into that specific question there. But first, let me answer you this. The Sixers just straight up added Paul George. There was not this massive trade, which was the case in previous Paul George switching locations. They did not have to give up a ton of assets or draft picks in the future. They straight up signed this guy. And to just add a dude who produced 22.6 points per game, 5.2 rebounds, 3.5 assists, shot 41.3% from three and 45.7% from the corner, that is a massive win. There are no if ands, or buts about it. And this is why, to me, this was always the option A for the Sixers. They still have their treasure trade chest of draft picks to work with that they can flip for win now role players they could draft guys who could develop and turn this into a young nucleus for the next generation of Sixers success they also have a still a little couple of cap space moves up their sleeves sitting around nine million dollars that they do have to work with so not a ton of wiggle room there because there is a lot of money tied up in this but the bottom line being you got Paul George, and don't let that get lost in things. That one team lost Paul George in the Clippers and got worse, and another team added Paul George in the Sixers and got better. So we don't got to dive into the overcomplications of this. But I do want to speak about the actual championship chances. We know the shortcomings of every part of this equation. We've heard the playoff P accusations, pandemic P accusations, where Paul George has had his shortcomings in the playoffs. We also have heard that with Joel Embiid. We've seen this with the Sixers organization, who have been capped at that second round, and this season did not even were not even able to make it past the first against the New York Knicks. But for Paul George specifically, I do want to talk about why I think this works for the Sixers. And to just put into perspective how good this trio is, that the three of them would have been the highest scoring trio in the NBA last season at 83.2 combined points per game. Now, I do think it's likely that the number probably dips a little bit this season as they will be eating into their touches a tiny bit. But we'll see how the injury factor plays out for all three of these guys with Joel Embiid and Paul George being at the forefront of that conversation there. But the most important part of this for me is the way this all works together. And when you think about building a dream roster from a cohesion standpoint, that's where the Sixers are at. That They have a true, legitimate all-star guard in Tyrese Maxey. They have a true, legitimate all-star wing in Paul George, who essentially is a guy who can be reduced to a 3-and-D role type guy if necessary. And he also can be a guy who climbs into a primary option in the right opportunity. And to round that out, or really to headline things, is their true MVP caliber big man in Joel Embiid. If you're picking a, if you're going to play threes on a basketball court right now, that's the what you want. That you want a guard, you want a wing, you want a big man. The fact that the Sixers will accomplish that with three guys who are absolutely top 25 players in the NBA is pretty absurd stuff. Now, to agree with Wendy a little bit here, the work is not done. That to take a look at the Sixers roster, there are just eight guys officially under contract, with one of those in Paul Reed likely not to be here next year for mainly financial reasons. So there is still work to done work to be done. But we have Joel Embiid. There is Paul George. There is Tyrese Maxey. Kelly Oubre is going to play a real impact and have a real role on the Sixers team, likely the starting two guard there. Andre Drummond is going to help this team. Eric Gordon will play a positive role. There is a lot to like about this Sixers team so far. So let's relax a little bit on these takes of why is Paul George picking him over the edge. I do think another part of this is there's been a lot of criticism for Paul George for his overall outlook and mindset. And I think there's a world where that's perfect for the Sixers team. And I know I hear you from the losing standpoint is the real complaint here. But when you think back to the Sixers team overall, there's always been kind of this passive aggression floating with Joel Embiid's pairing. That if you want to think back to the Ben Simmons era, there was a constant clash for stylistically. How do they want to play basketball? That Joel Embiid being more of a post scorer at that point in his career, a guy who wanted to play in the half court, and Ben Simmons was a pure fast break run and gun type player. Then it went to Jimmy Butler while Ben was still on the team. And there was this kind of just feuding underneath between Ben and Jimmy for who wants the ball in their hand more, who wants to be a point guard, with uh, even Embiid and Jimmy a little bit for who is the true closer or who is the guy here. There was a little bit of underlying just 
just weirdness that went down that season. Then there was James Harden, and there was this constant clash behind the scenes for, again, stylistically, how do you want to play basketball? That Joel Embiid did not love just being a pick-and-roll type big man. That was never his game, and to his credit, he adapted and made it work, and frankly, I think the Harden and Embiid duos were still a little bit more productive than probably the perception of them is, but there was still this feeling that James Harden wanted to be the guy, and that can't be the case when you're playing next to the literal MVP of the, of the league. Now, when thinking about this trio, it's clearly Joel Embiid's team. He's been the root, the core, the entirety, the face of the franchise for this era. They added Tyrese Maxey, and Maxey was that perfect combination of he totally respects Joel Embiid as a leader, a best player. There is this big brother, little brother type field to them, but he's also not afraid of the moment. That Tyrese Maxey will step to center stage, knock down some big time three pointers, and do what is necessary for this Sixers team. Then add Paul George to the mix, who I think it is fair to assess at this point, point in time does not have that mentality to be a number one or be an alpha or even be a number two to an extent. But you throw him into this mix, you can just be the talented basketball player you are without needing to bring on this, you know, forefront of the spotlight to be the guy. So I do think this works from a just cohesion and personality standpoint. And to fully answer Wendy's question and look at what happened to Paul George, let's take a peek at the teams that he has overall played for. To look at Paul George stats, and again, really impressive stuff. We're talking about a guy with a first ballot Hall of Fame resume already. But he started his career in Indiana and where was very much the guy. Spent seven seasons there until ultimately it was just time to move on. That was more of a blow-up move by Indiana than anything. And let's not forget that at this point in time, Paul George going head-to-head with LeBron James on the Miami Heat. He looked to be every bit of that dude, and that is the why that is the reason why he's regarded in such high light by a lot of these current NBA players that are coming up. The Brandon Millers and other guys who have mentioned him as stylistically their goat or the guy they modeled their game after. But he goes to Oklahoma City for two seasons here, and it was a situation which they were still competitive. They were still trying. Russell Westbrook was still on the team that they, you know, had a puncher's chance, but ultimately it did not work. Had a really good season in the one season post Russell Westbrook, where he led the league in steals, 28 points per game there. And then he was traded to the Los Angeles Clippers, in which I would say was viewed as the first move is like to put a team in championship contention. And by the way, I think that ages, I think, could make a real case that it is the worst trade in NBA history for him to be sent this way. And to lay it out in layman's term here, we're talking about the Clippers just getting Paul George for the Thunder to receive Shea Gilgis Alexander, who's turned into a legitimate MVP candidate, Danilo Gallinari, a 2021 first rounder, which turned into Trey Mann, a 2022 first rounder, which turned to Jalen Williams, who is probably their second best player on the Thunder at this point in time, the rights to a 2023 pick swap, a 2024 unprotected, a 2025 first rounder from the Heat, a rights to a 2025 pick swap, and then a 2026 unprotected. So they are still paying for Paul George while, in all reality, giving away the best player in this trade at this point in time in Shea Gildas Alexander. And it is a little unfair to use some of the context of this. For example, including Jalen Williams in this, it was the draft pick. It was not Jalen Williams himself, nor did anyone expect Jalen Williams to turn into the caliber of player that he fully has this quickly. But the point being that if you want to blame anyone for the Thunder, having all these assets and having being best positioned to a potential dynasty out there in the Western Conference, look right in the eyes of the Los Angeles Clippers and them decimate the farm for their options is certainly relevant to why they were unable to get over the hump and the ultimate answer here it's still health that for Paul George is not you know he is fully on the table for partial blame on this to dive into the amount of games that he played yes he played 74 games last year but when you look before that 56 31 54 48 he has not played uh, over 70 or over 60 games since that 2018-19 season before last year so hopefully that is a trend in the positive direction that he was able to suit up as often as he was last year but the the durability has been a concern and the guy that we really should be pointing fingers at if you want to talk about the Clippers not getting over the hump nobody wants to do it but it's Kawhi Leonard the bottom line is you just have to be on the floor man and for all the hate that Joel Embiid has gotten throughout his career for not being healthy in the playoffs you know what the dude's still out there competing for Kawhi Leonard He's just straight up not out there. And I'm not questioning that he's not injured or anything like that. I'm sure he's dealing with some real deal stuff. But I've also watched Joel Embiid come out here with a non-functioning face, a torn ligament in his knee, a torn ligament in his shooting arm, a facial guard, all these other things that he's just played through. And he's constantly been out there. So that is a guy that I'm ready to go to war with. And I think that should mean something. And while nobody wants to connect these dots or say this out loud either, you can't convince me that Kawhi Leonard's lack of availability wasn't at least 
partially dri- driving the reason why Paul George sold out greener pastures and why he is here in Philadelphia. So too windy. I love the hate. Keep it coming. But I want to hear it about the Sixers. I don't want the Sixers team to be regarded as this. Everyone loves them. Everyone's expecting them to win. I want them to be the underdogs. I want this to be a slept on team. So to be perfectly honest, I love it from Wendy. I hope this keeps coming. I hope people keep crapping on Paul George and Joel Embiid and that they're in this prove the wrong, prove the world wrong tour together. Because I do think they can do it. That that trio right there, Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid, and Paul George, 60% of their starting caliber or starting five right there, it does not get better than that. You can argue with me as much as you want. That's the best big three in the league. If you want to float out a team like Boston, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and then who? Is it Porzingis? Is it Derek White? Is it Drew Holiday? And I understand you could view this as a positive for the Celtics that they do have these kinds of options. But the reality is you got to put five on the floor and so do we and the best five will win. So we will see how the Sixers roster fully turns out from here. As I mentioned, still work to do from the Sixers and that this roster is far from complete and there are guys that need to be brought in to truly elevate this roster to a championship contender. But the start is as good as it gets. And I do think that this trio is ready to compete this season. Appreciate each and every one of you guys tuning into this video. Make sure to smash that subscribe button if you have not already. Drop a like on this video and anything else that you got on your mind in the comments. I'll be talking to you next time right here on Sixers Digest and appreciate each and every one of you guys once again. Peace.